here are the low EQ EDLs. Here are the high voltage, non-rated voltage losses. Here are the low non-rated voltage losses. This is again for all the fullerene and non-fullerene based devices we can find. And you see a lot of scatter on the data, but a clear trend. You see that the lower the CT state energy, the higher the non-rated voltage losses, or the worse, uh, the more non-rated decay and the lower the EQEEL. Um, this indicates that uh, these large voltage losses are um, intrinsic. They are uh, maybe related to the fact that we use organic materials. Because similar um, observations have been made uh, for organic materials, um, when you plot emission energy of the excited state or emission wavelength, or the, the energy of the triplet state on the x-axis, and you pl plot, for example, the non-radiative decay rate on the y-axis, then you can see that it's often observed that uh, the lower the emission energy, the higher the non-radiative decay rate. Um, here is the same for, for some triplet emitters. The lower the uh, emission energy, uh, the higher the non-radiative decay rate. Um, something similar, if you plot electroluminescence quantum efficiencies for the best OLEDs you can find, well, in the visible you, you have 100% emission quantum efficiency, but when you start going to the infrared, it's very hard or it's the, the emission quantum efficiency drops pretty rapidly. Uh, and I don't think anyone has ever has found uh, uh, an, an organic emitter at 900 nanometer or longer uh, with an electroluminescence quantum yield uh, of unity. So this seems uh, something general for organics, and the, the reason why it is so difficult to find at, at low uh, excitation energies to find um, good or high EQEELs is because the non-radiative rate uh, increases with decreasing uh, emission energy. Um, this is the, the explanation uh, uh, given to this effect for, for it's called the, the energy gap law for, for radiationless transitions in large uh, or in molecules, in organic molecules. The reason why uh, um, a low excitation energy, as drawn here, uh, you have more non-rated recombination than when you have a high um, excitation energy is because tunneling, uh, if you see non-rated recombination as tunneling from the uh, excited state to a higher vibrational energy of the ground state, this tunneling is um, proportional to the wave function overlap, and you can see that the wave function overlap or the higher vibrational states of the ground state um, is less when, this, when the emission energy is higher. When the emission energy is lower, you, you can easily, more easily couple to or tunnel to a lower vibrational uh, energy state of the ground state. Um, if you want to know more about this, and I think this is important because these non-radiative transitions are limiting VOC, and you will see later they will are also limiting the noise current, at least for the very low gap acceptors. Uh, so we need to understand uh, these concepts better. So if you want to understand this better, it's these type of papers which uh, you should read. Okay. Having this and, and using it, uh, we, we were here, uh, this graph I've shown you before and the CT state energy or the, the gap energy versus the non-radiative uh, losses. Uh, so you see they are, we haven't found anywhere they, these non-radiative losses are zero. Um, and well, you can draw some empirical lines to here and basically say, well, since we haven't found any um, uh, organics with non-radiative voltage losses being far below what's drawn here. This must mean that the maximum efficiency of organic solar cells is reduced from the radiative limit. Uh, the radiative limit or the shockley kaiser limit for solar cells, uh, for a single junction solar cell, that's this black curve. That assumes EQEEL is one. If you now assume, well, EQEEL is gonna follow uh, a relation a bit like this. Uh, we've drawn here two, two lines, a lower limit. I forgot to draw the lines here and an average limit. This would reduce uh, the maximum efficiency you can get with organics from 33 to 25. I think we would be very happy if we can get 25. Um, so, it, but that would mean that we need very high external quantum, photovoltaic external quantum efficiencies, very high fill factors of 90%. Um, then we would reach here above 20%. So it's not impossible with organics to reach 
efficiencies above 20%. This is what we deduce from this. And the other thing which you can learn from this, if you want to increase, uh, yeah, the, the other thing you can um, deduce from this is that the, the optimum gap for a single junction solar cell is not uh, 1.1 EV as in as in inorganics, but it's actually uh, higher, more around 1.5, maybe even 1.6 EV to be on the safe side. So it doesn't make sense to lower the gaps even more, at least for single junction organic solar cells. Okay, that was uh, for solar cells and an, an, an efficiency limit. We can do something similar now for the photodetectors, at least the infrared photodetectors, because uh, we, we learned all this about VOC. And then previously we have said, well, in this, where the gaps of the organics are very low, uh, the dark current is linked to the VOC via uh, formulas like this. Um, and the dark and the VOC is linked to the energy of the CT state, as as long uh, as uh, in the regime where the CT state energies are low enough. In, in this regime, dark currents are limited by other things, contacts, traps, pinholes in the device, uh, and so on. But once the, the the gaps are low enough, the, the intrinsic dark currents are so high they dominate all other um, effects. And at this point, you can link everything we know about VOC and ECT to the dark current. So from that point on is actually for wavelengths longer than 1300 nanometer. Uh, so in this regime. Um, if we then use the same approach, well, again, this graph here is basically the same graph of you've shown before, just plotted uh, with different colors and different points. It's, it's again the ECT versus the non-radiative voltage losses which we can link to VOC, which we can then link to dark currents, which we then can link, and that's what we did here right? on this graph. We plot wavelength versus this specific detectivity. This specific detectivity is the signal-to-noise ratio, which is important for photodetectors, or something proportional to signal-to-noise ratio, which is important for photodetectors. You want as high as possible, so low noise and high EQs. So for silicon, for example, this specific detectivity in this range, uh, this is the absorption range of silicon, it, it goes over 10 to the power 13. For the ingas detectors and germanium detectors, we're more here 10 to the power 12, but they, uh, of course, extend to wavelengths uh, around uh, 1,800 nanometers. The black curves are, are the best organics, uh, at least in the in beyond, which go beyond the thousand nanometer, which we have. So they are not as good as silicon. They extend the wavelength range a bit. They are in that wavelength range a bit better than ingas, but ingas goes deeper. So the question I asked in the beginning was, well, does it make sense? Can we, with organics, extend our wavelength range as much as, for example, uh, in uh, ingas? Uh, and keep the same low dark currents and the same high detectivities. Well, if the VOC, uh, if the non-radiative losses remain like they are, like, like plotted here with the blue line, so we use the blue line, we know about VOC, we link it to the dark current, we link it to the noise current, then you would expect specific detectivities not uh, exceeding the blue curve here in this graph, which would mean that if you want to keep the same sensitivity signal to noise ratio as ingas with organics, we predict that you can do this, but you can do this only up to here, maybe 1300, 1400 nanometer and not further. Unless we found concepts which decrease all these non radiative losses and this non radiative recombination to values like the green line or the red line. The red line is from a model which assumes very low reorganization energies. Uh, then we would get specific detectivities uh, like the red curve here or maximum specific detectivities like the red curve and we would be able to reach here. Even then, we will not beat in this small uh, wavelength range in gas detectors. Uh, maybe that's not necessary, but it's good to know what we can and cannot do, uh, what we expect to can and cannot do with organic photodetectors. That's what I uh, want to show with this graph. So up to 1600 nanometer, uh, might make sense to try unless you can live with lower signal to noise ratios depending on the application um okay i still have no i don't have any more time i think or do i but maybe i'll just take two minutes 
I, I wanted to show you an approach uh, besides uh, to go to the just stop me when I need to stop and I will just continue. I wanted to show you an approach uh, which we have, which uh, which doesn't uh, because it's not so easy to make very low gap uh, polymers and then find the right acceptor to combine with them. So the approach we are following is to try to use charge transfer absorption to increase um, in to no to to achieve infrared absorption. Here is a a material system PP triple T blended with PCBM. There's a lot of interface um, which makes that there would be a lot of interfacial absorption but as you can see this is on a logarithmic scale the eqe here is the gap of pb triple t here's the gap of pcbm and then all this absorption here extends all the way to the infrared uh, that's all charge transfer absorption so absorption from the interface between the donor and the acceptor only it's a pity it's it's nice in the infrared it's broad it's just weak it's 50 times weaker than pb triple t absorption so we looked for concepts to increase the CT absorption. One easy, well, easy way to do this is instead of using transparent electrodes is to use partly reflecting electrodes. In that case, light goes into the device and start bouncing in between the two mirrors until it's absorbed, at least roughly. Uh, this only happens for certain resonance wavelengths, which are proportional to the thickness of what's sandwiched between the two mirrors. So if you do this for PB triple T and you replace the ITO with a with a thin layer of silver, which is partly reflecting, you, you can get these effects. And then when you tune the thickness, and this is what I'll do when I push the next slide, you can see um, we can basically increase CT absorption in a certain wavelength range. Um, and this wavelength, this, this, this wavelength, the resonance wavelength, is proportional to the thickness. And we can get EQEs up to uh, 15. Uh, the simulation is, is the, is on the top curves. This is the, the real measurement. So here we are at 1.25 EV. That's half an EV below the gap of C60 and P triple T. And we still have an EQE of 10%, which is purely based on CT absorption, but then increased by this cavity uh, concept. We can also go to the second overtone, and then we get a bit sharper peaks and a bit higher EQEs. You can do this, well, the nice thing is because this the resonance wavelength only depends on the thickness of the active layer. Um, you can basically very quickly make a spectrometer uh, like this. You, you print a, a layer with changing thickness and you then you have a gradient um, of in the thickness and then you, you put the electrodes on top, the, the two partly reflecting and fully reflecting electrodes. And then each pixel detects another wavelength uh, and we've proved that it works by measuring the transmission of water, which has a peak around a thousand nanometer. I will slowly uh, stop and skip a bit. Uh, we did the same for small molecule solar cells. Uh, we measured response times, if, if you, which can be rather fast. Uh, well, they're not uh, good enough for, for very high speed networks or something like this, but good enough for readout if you would want to put it in an imager or something. Uh, what we're further trying to do is go to further to, to really long wavelengths. We do this then simply by, um, yeah, in, overall de increasing the homo or decreasing the lumo. Here are some examples uh, which we are doing this. The success is not very high yet, not very high EQEs yet, mainly because we're using materials from OPV, the failed OPV materials, basically the low VOC OPV materials. And we're also playing with the cavities a bit. We're here, for example, we put two cavities on top of each other, and then you have two detectors, one detector which detects one wavelength and another detector on the bottom which detects another a second wavelength. You can use this, for example, in temperature sensors or to recognize uh, certain, com certain uh, uh, species which absorb at those two wavelengths. Okay, uh, yes. In, in this full speed last part, I made it to my conclusions, with, uh, which maybe I'll just let you read because I spoke long enough. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Yikun. Um.